America Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. We're going to talk to take some psalms tonight because uh, a lot of people never read the psalm. They're beautiful, beautiful prayers. We read them every day. See, the psalm says, this is Psalm 46. Depends on your Bible. It could be 45. God is our refuge and our strength. Is he yours? Ask yourself. Is God your refuge and your strength? Who do you go to when you don't know where to go? Who do you talk to when you're just filled up to hit? Who? That's where I go to my neighbor. Wonderful. Sometimes. Sometimes the whole neighborhood knows it before midnight. And they don't mean any harm. They just can't keep it to themselves. That's all. Women, and I happen to be one, are notorious for having to share in the wrong thing. But what are you going to do for Lent? Try not to gossip. See, I don't gossip. What are you talking about for an hour and a half every morning? The weather? No, that wouldn't take an hour and a half. Uh, the Holy Father? No, no, I don't think that. Virtue? Mm, I don't think, no. The economy? Mm, maybe. You talk about somebody. What you say may be right or wrong. Inevitably, though, you'll say something wrong. And if something nobody knows, then you can commit slander or calumny, you see. Why don't you try for Lent not to gossip? Some of you are going to be mighty miserable. I said that to a woman years ago, and she looked at me horrified. Well, 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 what do I talk about? I says, well, think of something else. Like what? I said, well, anything. Can't you talk about the weather or the weather? I said, okay, talk about anything. She had a hard time, but she learned something, you see. She got into a bad habit that so she couldn't shake real quick. I know, I know, you can give up cigarettes and candy and... <sighs> Isn't it strange? She our Lent, the Sisters Lent began yesterday. We start two days before Ash Wednesday. And I had to do some shopping today. And usually I can pass a sh one of these supermarket counters where they got all these pies and cakes and 
with cinnamon rolls and all these good things, you know, and they were hot. You could smell them when you came into the store, and I said to myself, I don't think I should be in here. <laughs> so I start my prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a poor sinner, and keep me away from the bakery department. <laughs> But he didn't. <laughs> and I saw sister and brother slowly meandering in that direction. I said, oh. I said, Lord, do you mind if I wish I had one? I mean, if I don't eat it and I don't buy one, do you mind if I wish it? And I had a feeling he wasn't too hot on that either. I passed it fast. <laughs> they passed it slow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, doing this on one of the counters while they're meandering around and feeling this bread. It's, it's the one you can buy a loaf of bread. Did you know how many people feel bread when they go in? <laughs> Did you ever see that? Huh? They go. And, and that bread's soft, you know. You wonder, why am I buying this bread? Everybody in the world has just crushed it. You know? So I'm watching all this happen, and even this little kid went up to Big Loaf of Bread and went. <laughs> so even though we make good intentions, good intentions, we still have a problem. Now, ordinarily, those sweets wouldn't bother me at all. Not a. I'm diabetic, so I have to stay away from sweets. But they're only attractive during Lent. <laughs> See? So now, I don't have that attraction to sweets. So I have to say, Lord, how come, how come, I like sweets and lead. Well, how would I have a penance if I didn't give something up? See, God allows me to pass these places. We bake our own bread, and that's okay, because bread is bread, you know? But I'm not hungry at all until I smell that bread. Now I gotta make a sacrifice. Lord, I gotta wait, let's see, two hours before I eat that bread. You say, boy, mother, you got a lot of problems. <laughs> we all do, we all do. We miss the little sacrifices, you see, little ones. And you're gonna get a lot of little ones. I promote to the sisters and I promote to you tonight. Instead of giving up things, give up sin. You should give it up entirely. And this is a good time to give it up entirely. Big sins, little sins. What's a little sin? Well, I never quite found out. But gossiping is one, lying is another. You say, it's a white lie. What's a white lie? What's a white lie? Is there a black lie and a white lie? Well, what's the black lie? It's a biggie, but a lie is a lot, don't you think? Like this, you know, this woman saw this woman coming and she really didn't want her to come and visit. And so she told her son, she said, go tell her I'm not home. And he ran to the door and the bell rang and he opened the door. He said, my mother said to tell you she's not home. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> I thought that's one smart kid. <laughs> he did exactly what she told him. Exactly. But see, these are, well, you call that a white lie. Is that what you call a white lie? What else is a white lie? Well, uh, somebody passes by and said, oh, I saw you. Uh, looking in the window of that pornography thing the other day. Me, I was not there. 
they know you were there. You know you were there. Is that a white lie? It's a lie. You see, what happens to us is we don't understand. Once you begin to lie a little bit, if there is such a thing, then telling the truth doesn't matter anymore. You know, telling the truth doesn't matter anymore. I think compromise is a little bit like that. I know you'll all disagree with me and quote St. Thomas or whoever you want to quote. But you know, what happens is that our body, our soul, our mind gets accustomed to half truth, half truth. And, and we don't know, after a while, you don't know the difference, you see. Problem with lying is you begin to believe your own lie. It's a big problem. Why? Because after a while, you forget the first lie. <laughs> It piles up on you, see? And all of a sudden now, you have to lie about the lie. So that doesn't get you anywhere. Our Lord didn't create us to lie. He, gave, he made us, you and I, in his image. In his image, who is the way and the truth and the life. We have to be like Jesus. Give lying up this for Lent. Give up deceit. Here comes the woman and she has a, a purple blouse, a green skirt, like Kelly Green, uh, a blue jacket. Are you getting the picture? You are? You are? Okay and tennis shoes. <laughs> and you meet her, or you just can't say, oh, hi, you look horrible. <laughs> 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 you can't say that, you wouldn't say that. Why just can't you say hello? How are you? No, what do you come up with? Oh, you look great today, colorful. <laughs> colorful? What does that mean, colorful? Your cheeks are red, your... I, I paid for some groceries not too long ago. This poor girl had a ring on her tongue, a little ball or something. <laughs> I didn't want to gazed at her, you know, but I just wondered how it kept going around. <laughs> a, a ring in her eyelashes, a ring in one nostril, and one ear. <sighs> I wanted to say, why are you <sighs> desecrating a body God made for you? But I, I couldn't do it because There wasn't time to explain. I just prayed for her because obviously she likes it, you know. These things, as you're going through these and you see all this kind of stuff, it's very hard not to criticize rash judge and all the rest because it looks hideous. Why don't we instead, for Lent, say a prayer for them, for all of them? So if you're an angry person, even-tempered, always mad. <laughs> even-tempered, always mad. Well, why don't you change, just for Lent? Are you saying that for 40 days you cannot be nice? Oh yeah, you can. God never created nasty people. We make ourselves nasty. And don't blame it on your pirate great 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 grandfather or whoever he was. You know, I got that excuse not so long ago. I said to this person, "Why are you always upset?" 
He said, well, we went through our family tree and in 13 something, I forget what it was, my, my uncle was a pirate. 1300, and you're still suffering from that? I said, you're kidding me. No, he was a pirate. I said, then why do you, why do you want to act like a jackass? <laughs> I mean, there's a big difference between a pirate and the way you're acting. You see, we, we just, we don't want to take the bull by the horns, and you are the bull. That's the problem. You don't acknowledge the bull you take by the horns is you, not your neighbor. It doesn't take it doesn't take that much energy to be kind. I think losing your temper is very fatiguing. First of all, you have to be mad before you blow. Right? That's fatiguing. Then you blow. You don't feel any better because you're spending time wishing you had added some more. <laughs> I wish I'd have said this or I wish I'd have said that. I had this great opportunity of laying them flat and I lost it. <laughs> now you're mad again. <laughs> Not only mad, now you, you go to bed that way, you can't sleep. You get up in the morning, you're grouchy, you're irritated. All that takes energy. All of that takes energy. So what do you do? If you have a tendency to drink, you take a drink. If you have a tendency to overeat, you start eating. But it don't help you. You're still mad. You don't go to Jesus. See, that's what it's going to say here. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Here. Well, am I here or am I not here? Okay, we're not here. <laughs> okay, Lord. Okay. After a session like that, in Psalm 46, thank you. I have a great producer. She looks up stuff I forget. He says here, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Oh, really? We shall not fear, for God is my refuge and my strength. Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, Though the mountains tremble, I shall not fear. Don't you wish you had that kind of holiness, huh? Don't you wish you had that kind of trust in God? Mm. Wow. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. Is that happening today, huh? But the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Wow. What a God we have. This Lent, we have to put all our faults and weaknesses, we have to give them to Jesus and ask Our Lady to renew our hearts and our minds and our souls so we can be holy men and women. It doesn't mean you have visions and ecstasies. and It doesn't mean you're, you're talking to the Lord and He's talking to you every five minutes. It doesn't mean anything except, I want to be like Jesus. And the things we do every day are not like Jesus. God is king of all the earth. 
He reigns over the nations and sits on his holy throne. Hmm. Well, if you look at Psalm 50, 51 really, this is after David committed adultery. And he was sorry. And not only that, but he, he killed this woman's husband. You know the way it amazes me? That David was loved by God and punished by God. Punished by God for his grave sin. And I, I want you to, to, to hear this tonight because so many of you are in such grave depths of sin that you're disheartened and discouraged and you, you just think it's hopeless. So you keep going down, 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 down. No, don't do that. I want you to, I want you to hear this psalm after David committed adultery and the prophet said to him, there was a man who had only one sheep. But the man himself had thousands of sheep. And someone came to him. And instead of taking one of his own sheep, he took the man's sheep who was only one. He only had one lamb. And he took that from him and slaughtered it and gave it to his guest. And David was furious. David said, that man shall die. Where is he? The prophet said, you, you are that man. Oh, wow. Some of you think God doesn't know what you do. I got news for you. I got bad news for you. He knows. Well, most of us today, because our faith is so weak, we would just despair and just keep doing what we're doing. You know, that's how God made me. Oh, he didn't make you that way. That's crazy. But here's what David said. And we begin to know why God loved David, but he wouldn't let him build the temple. <laughs> he said, now, David, you, you spilled too much blood. Your son shall build me a temple. You shall not. Mm. Yeah, the Lord was rough with David. Because he didn't do right all the time. But here's David's response. Have mercy on me, O God according to thy steadfast love. According to thy abundant mercy, please blot out my transgressions. Isn't that beautiful? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. It's very important that we know. We don't know our transgressions anymore. Everything's okay. It's not. See, David knew. I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Hmm. Against thee. And thee alone, Lord, have I sinned. You see, we don't know that. We don't realize that. We do not realize that when we commit grievous sin, we sin against God. Not only your neighbor, but against God. And I have done what that which is evil in your sight. Hmm. I tell you, sweetheart, you can pick some hotel in Timbuktu and 
he will see you. Just say you're sorry. And here's what David said. Thou art justified in thy sentence, blameless in thy judgment. It's amazing to me how many people say, why did this happen to me? I'm good. I go to church every week. I give alms. Why? God is wise and holy. He knows why. We don't have to know why. David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It's not blaming God. Behold, thou desires truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my, sac in my secret heart. Secret heart. See, David is, is not only repentant, but he acknowledges that God saw him and God was justified in punishing him. We don't think that way. We talk about chastisement, and I feel obligated to tell you, it's here. Well, we got to put up with it because we deserve it. That's what David's saying. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So in David, there was repentance and hope. See, we may be repentant. It turns into guilt. Is that not true? But we, our, our, our repentance has to turn into humility of heart. Fill me with joy and gladness and let the bones which you have broken rejoice. He's, he's acknowledging, I deserve what I get. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. See, David had to talk to God, plead to God, plead with God, talk to the prophet. All you need to do is go to confession. <sighs> Why is it so hard? Now what does David say? Well, he says, clean, create in me a clean heart of God and put a new spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. See, he's acknowledging that he doesn't deserve what God is giving him. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me. Uphold me. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will return to thee. Isn't that what our Lord said to Peter? Huh? <sighs> Simon, Simon, he said. The devil has wished to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. And once you are converted, convert your brethren. Oh, no. All you sinners out there, if you ever straightened out, you could help convert others. That's what he told Peter. And that's what David's asking for. Open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. We say that every day at the divine office. The sacrifice, I want you to hear this. David said in the 17th verse, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken 
spirit. Did you hear that? The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. Repentance. Do good to Zion in thy good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And thou that royal delight in burnt offerings, and bulls will be offered on your altar. So, you see the difference between us today. We have a hard time acknowledging sin and a harder time repenting. Guilt is not repentance. Guilt, the wrong kind of guilt anyway, is a kind of sorry that I did this. I can't believe I did this. Yeah, you can believe it. You just did it. <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't believe you did it. You just did it. Are you blind or something? I, if you can't come up with the words of Psalm 50, in some Bibles it's 51. If you can't come up with those words yourself, at every Mass we say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, my fault. My fault, my most grievous fault. And then raise your mind and heart to God after a nice, good confession. And those of you not Catholic, kneel down somewhere. Say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I won't do that again. See, that is repentance. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. And what is your question? Um, I, my question is about my son. My 17-year-old son passed away on All Souls Day. He died of a fatal asthma attack. And we understand that it's the will of God that he should be with him. But my other children are having difficulty with it. And I would hope that you could help them to understand why God took their brother. Your, your son died at three, three months ago? Is that it? Are you there? Well, anyway, that's what she said? Okay. That's where trust comes in, honey. He's 17 years old, huh? And we don't know. We don't know, because we do not have the far-reaching mind of God. We don't have it. We can be sure that God takes us at that moment we're best prepared. That's why in the old litanies we prayed very hard not to have a sudden or unprovided death. If you know, if a doctor comes up to you and says you got six months, thank God, don't have a breakdown. You got six months to prepare. You may be the only one that knows in that whole city. So what? What a grace that would be. But now why your son died? You can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I don't understand. But you're, the Lord knows your son better than you do or did. He also knows what might have happened to him. And whether he died from an accident or ill health or some disease, there's one thing you can be sure. God knew it and decided it was the best for him. You cannot help feeling angry or bad or missing him, but you can be sure and all your children can be sure 
that the Father, the eternal Father, looked down and accepted him. That's what's important. We're all so stuck in this life. Huh? The only one we know, it's the only one we know. We're born into a world. We have to learn. We have to be hurt. We have to suffer. We have to be joyful. We have to eat and get indigestion after we eat. We go through all of this and we all do the same thing. But our real life is ahead of us. And you, your husband, and your other children must look forward to the time when you will see him again forever. See? There is separation in death, and there's loneliness in death. But it's not over. It's not over. There's just a little interim period when you don't have them, but you'll see them again. And you'll enjoy heaven together. And you, you see, the, 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 the soul is not eternal. There was a time it was not, but it's immortal. You oh, I don't believe that. Who cares whether you believe it or not? We're not depending on whether you believe it. I mean, we'd be a bunch of crazy people running around. This one believes, this one doesn't. This one believes, this one doesn't. This one believes, this one. Take your choice. Why you take your choice? God doesn't to do that. The Lord Father in justice, because he gave us his son, in justice has to tell us the truth. He cannot lie. You know, St. John, I think liar was a, his favorite word. If you look in St. John's Gospel or the epistles, he uses it frequently. He said, if you say you do not sin, you call God a liar. Oh, wow. How do you do that? If you say the commandments are nil, and since God gave us the commandments, then you're calling God a liar. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I'd think it over. But you never dawned on you, did you? Adultery is a sin. Now, if they said it, we love each other. Don't give me that baloney. Don't love each other at all. Now, what happens? You say, no, God says it is a sin. And you're saying, no, it's a sin. It is not a sin. And what are you doing? You're calling God a liar. It's the same with abortion. Abortion is a grievous sin, an act of murder. And you're saying, no, it's a choice. Now you call God a liar. To tell me, I don't think we know what we're doing. You can't live this life and keep calling God a liar. Those commandments are there. I read an article, a big page of a famous man in America wrote his own commandments, and I can tell you where they're going, sweetheart. <laughs> they're going the same place you're on your way to. Because you can't write the commandments. They've been written centuries ago. You and I have to follow them. You, you cannot say the commandments are not right, you see. We have another call. Hello? Yes. Mother. Yes. Where are you from? I'm from Rhode Island, Bristol. Oh, great. Yes, I had a question for you. Yeah. How is a man, you know, or actually any individual, you know, who's surrounded by science because of their work and uh, also at their age where they start to 
I don't know, feel like they need to go about and embrace everything in life, but at the same time, live a to the commandments lifestyle, but at the same time, almost because of science and the way things are going in our technological, you know, endeavors, has fallen away from the belief. And I want to know if you have any way or tricks or, or some way to keep the faith. I have I have a hard time people losing their faith with some scientists. He has to be a stupid scientist not to believe in a god. From nothing comes more nothing. You know, we're talking about this warming business, okay? It also warmed up in the Bronze Age and the whole world fell apart. Maybe we got another Bronze Age. Maybe we got a scientist age or a, a silver age or a smart age now. You know, we're all so smart. I don't know how you could look at a sunrise. They don't know anything about the sun. They think they do. They spend all these things up there. They couldn't even land, have them. They have these scientific things up there and they're living there for months and they come down, we don't know it, what happened. All they're doing is analyzing what is already there. They, all they, can, they can't even create, oh, now they're gonna clone. But they need something to clone with. And that something was created by God. <laughs> You know, there's a joke that says, the scientist was arguing with God. He said, well, look, we don't need you. We can do everything. And we can make men. Uh, the father said, fine, go ahead. And the scientist said, well, I need some dirt. He said, well, that's mine. You can't do anything without starting with something God already created. Please don't let a scientist who doesn't even believe in God make you think there is not a God. I told you a couple of weeks ago about the, the teacher, the professor who was an atheist. He was dying and he said goodbye to his wife because his whole idea was he would sink into darkness and that would be the end of him. Well, it wasn't because he saw himself getting off the gurner and he's looking and his wife was crying and the doctors were working on him. And he said to his wife, hey, hey, I'm okay. She didn't hear. His soul was there and he didn't know. He didn't know what to do because that wasn't what he believed in. All of a sudden he hears two voices in the hallway and he goes out there, they were two little demons, but they were too little, taking him into a fog. And it got deeper and deeper. This is totally out of his brain. He didn't know what to do. And they start clawing at him on the way down. You know, I've read a lot of after-death experiences I never read one that was gone to hell. They're all seeing lights and Jesus talking to them. And, I mean, it seems to be wonderful and they don't want to come back. But this guy, I mean, he was petrified. And finally he says, oh God, well, those two disappeared on him. Then he realized something he never did before. He said, Jesus, save me. And then the fog was gone. And our Lord came and two angels came and showed him his entire life. My friend, the discoveries of today will be nothing tomorrow. That's the way it is. Because there's always new 
discoveries. In the time we were talking about this morning, the sisters and I, in the time of St. Teresa of Avila, she had stomach cancer. That's what she had. Every time she gets sick, they put these leeches on and, and bleed her. God. That was the scientists of that day. <laughs> it, it's a wonder she didn't bleed to death. Our Holy Father Francis had eye problems from crying so much for his sins or everybody else's. They put a hot coal on his eye, blinded him. That was the science of that day. People died and died and died, but somebody said, I think when you perform an operation, you better wash your hands. What? Are you mental? Why do I have to wash my hands? What's wrong with my hands? They're full of germs. What are germs? <clears throat> 200 years later, we found out what germs were. In the meantime, all these women died. That was science in that day. You know, I learned to have great intellects today. In fact, the greatest intellects have been among us the last 50 years. We'll take, we'll give them 60 years, okay? We'll add 10 more to it. But if the intellect God gave you, and you allow the enemy to turn it against him and say there is no God, in the midst of such proof. I don't, I think that's stupidity. You can be smart and dumb at the same time. I'm happy I was dumb. Because <laughs> I'm free to say, oh God, I love you for being so good to me. You read your scripture and follow the teachings of the church and you will not be deceived.